who were and are the original native peoples of New England. How is their world put together? How do they understand the universe and themselves? What has the history of Native New England been? And how did this young scholar of Native America, Nana Pashima, also known as Anthony Pollard, help these peoples of Native New England to take a strong new hold upon their world, on their cultures, and so upon their own destiny? This is the story of Nana Pashimut, Anthony Pollard, and a look at what some have called the rebirth of native New England in the 20th century. important piece of who we were as a people were that um, we had a very intricate web of how our politics, our economics, our, our spirituality, or our religion, our culture, and our community were intertwined with each other all throughout New England, um, basically through confederacies, um, through language, through intermarriage that took place amongst the tribes. Um, for me, as a Nipmuc, specifically between Wampanoag, Narragansett, uh, Pequots, Mohegans, um, people who intertraveled and traveled amongst sort of the river streams inland further, uh, had also also had very unique economic system that was based on the waterways. They could do most of their trade through the waterways and bring um, seafood in from people who were on the coast, bring it into the inland and. Uh, I think that also to say that most people um, all think that we're, we were peaceful at that time as well, but we did things that insulted each other and occasionally got into sort of conflicts with each other around um, not necessarily land issues, but sort of the courtesies that people attributed to each other. Um, uh, for instance, is a, a story that I was told when I was really young was how the Narragansetts and my tribe, the Nipmucks, got into a war over what they fed each other where the Narragansetts had invited the Nipmucks down for a feast and served us lobster and all of this fish because they were coastal. And when we uh, brought them back inland and invited them back inland for, for, for a feast, what happened was they, they were insulted the fact that we were feeding the, them eel in these freshwater fish that were brown and not as colorful and maybe a little musky for their taste being uh, seafarers and eating out of the sea. So they, were, they insulted our food and basically led to a war that sort of lasted for a couple of years. Um, a family feud, I guess, is the best way, but we were intermarried. So I think that if, if I was trying to get across to them anything, it would be that we were similar, but uniquely and vastly different at the same time, based on where we lived and the terrain that we lived in. Kids often come in and they'll say, well, what's the big deal about Native people in New England? I mean, they didn't build pyramids and uh, they didn't have the fancy cliff dwellings of people in the Southwest did. And then I say to kids, well, could you survive in Andover year-round with only the things that you can find for yourself? Can't call for a pizza, can't go to the mall, can't call your mom, can't get a lawyer. Can you take care of yourself? And it's interesting to watch kids go, Oh, I never thought about that. I mean, to be completely independent, completely self-reliant, and at the same time have a culture that is rich, vibrant, and successful, because these guys were here for thousands and thousands of years. And then kids begin to say, oh, maybe they know something we don't know. Uh, traditionally, Native people in, in New England uh, are what anthropologists, archaeologists call hunter-gatherers. 
which isn't very elegant. Uh, maybe the better way to think of that is they were extremely knowledgeable and extremely sophisticated consumers of everything that the environment had to offer them. And that meant uh, large animals, deer, moose, elk, seal, whales, bear, small animals, fish, turtles, and a wide variety of plants, nuts, berries, plums, all kinds of stuff. And the real sophistication, and, and again, one of those kinds of knowledge that I think we have lost, and to some degree they have lost, was that incredibly astute ability to know where things were and when the time was to get them. I mean, since you couldn't go to the store and get them, you either had to know when to do it, or you had to do without. And one of the kinds of knowledges that apparently was passed down was exactly that. Well, if it gets dry, here's where you can find water. If that medicine, if that plant doesn't heal you, try this one. If you can't find game here, because the weather's bad, sometimes my great-grandfather told me the game would be over there. You know, that terrifically sophisticated and detailed understanding of their world. I think I'd like them to know that, um, to, to really stop and think and, and realize how long native people, you know, here, as well as, you know, other indigenous people all over the world, living in their own original, you know, traditional cultures um, that have lived like that for thousands of years, got everything they needed, they lived very comfortably, um, happily, and did not destroy the earth. It's, it's almost, it's a, a physical, but I guess an invisible connection to the land. You know, this, this land here, I, I mean, I can feel it. You know, if someone, if someone uh, cuts a road through the woods to, um, you know, they're gonna put in a new house or a housing development or something like that, I mean, I feel pain in my gut. You know, I react very physically. You know, we were healthy and long-lived, and we, as I said a minute ago, we had everything we needed. We knew where to get it, you know, on the earth, and and yet to sustain the earth, um, as our job was to keep it as it was created, with as little disturbance as possible, and we were able to do that, and yet get everything we needed and, and live, you know, a good life. And, and that's something that people just completely miss, or a lot of people seem to. Just the bits and pieces of information that we have about their, um, their views of the universe, their cosmological beliefs, and their, um, their philosophy, and so on, their religion, are, are images of great beauty. They, they had a, uh, a very elaborated understanding of the organization of the cosmos with a three-tiered um, structure consisting of the upper and sky world occupied by a number of, of human-like beings um, who were not humans, of course, sometimes called beings other than human, um, such as the Thunderbirds, the Thunderers, for example, who were concerned with um, life and um, with, with health and with power. And then the middle world, which is the world occupied by human beings, and the underworld occupied by other spirits and beings other than human uh, who also concern themselves with with um, with life and with death and with healing um, there was not the the same kind of sort of life and death or black and white or dualistic distinctions that are made in western um, cosmology but rather the spirits of the sky world and the spirits or the beings of the underworld shared equally in um, concerns about life and death. For example, there wasn't the same kind of contrast between good and evil as um, was, um, it, it appears to be suggested in Western philosophy, uh, Western religious philosophy. So 
the irony is that a lot of the early 17th century sources written by Englishmen would say, for example, as Th Thomas Morton did, they have no spirituality, they have no religion. I think part of that had to do with the fact that it was such a taken for granted aspect of native life that it was something that was easily missed by people who expected religion to take a very formal, visible, um, and separate um, form and practice, and that it often required for the English a separate dwelling and a separate accoutrements and a separate costume and a separate discourse were all part of what it, what it meant to be religious in, in 17th century English terms. But for the native people, um, the practice was in a sense exactly opposite that because it was just part of the way everyday life was carried out. We are standing in front of a one of three boulders located in the Patriarch State Forest in the eastern part of Connecticut, some 25,000 acres. There are three boulders that make a triangulation, this being the largest of the three known as Boulder A. Boulder B is 97 feet behind it, and Boulder C forms the top of the pyramid 187 feet to the west. This boulder is interesting because it has some interesting pectoglyphs in it, and that they, they've been carved and pecked out in the granite itself. Not a soft rock to work, not like limestone or out west where you get sandstone where it's much easier to peck into. This is extremely hard rock. Anyway, in addition to this boulder, boulder B, this is boulder A, boulder B, and boulder C, all three are marked at least with circles. We know that. Similar role. In addition to that, astronomical alignments are perfect to that particular triangle. What you see here is the true horizon. This is a lake around here, so you can clearly see it. But the true horizon is hidden by the hill, which is Econk Hill. That means that all sunrises that are the true, which you could not see, take 21 minutes to clear the hill. It becomes a false horizon. That changes the angulation of the sun. In other words, during the summer solstice at this site, if you could see through the hill, it would really rise over here at 57 degrees. But what happens, but it wouldn't align with anything. But what happens here is that by the time it clears the hill, tw hill 21 minutes later, it is at 72 degrees, the exact summer solstice when these two boulders align from June 11th to July 1st because of the hill. Also, the secondary two boulders are over here, boulder B and what we call boulder P, which is a planning calendar, is that when the sun begins moving north during the summer, hitting the, s the shortest day of the year, it passes over this alignment at April 30th and May 1st. That's the planning time for corn. Moves to the summer solstice, which is directly over this big rock, does its, its stay, solstice meaning stationary sun, from June 11th to July 1st, and then begins moving south again, passes back over the planting stone between August 12th and 13th. That's the green corn harvest, and then passes over Boulder C and B, which is at 90 degree on September 5th, exactly 120 days between the two, which is planting of corn for here in the Northeast. An incredible thing that is only possible because use of a false horizon. The legend of Turtle Island rising from the waters is no myth. Our Paleo-Indian ancestors and archaic ancestors actually saw this land uplift over time from the weight of the glacier as it receded with the subsequent drowning of the coastline as the waters rose again with the meltwater release. It was the New England Genesis, and it is significant that the legend was preserved through the ages without the aid of the written word. Oral tradition can be as permanent as any other form as long as it is faithfully practiced. Those first bands who entered the New England region, presumably from the southwest of it, found the recently glaciated landscape quite different from that which they were familiar. Thus, former concepts and practices had to be altered to address the dramatically different conditions they found here. The analogy is clear. They had the landscape evolved together. No others could ever know their country better or adapt spiritual concepts more intimately to the landscape and to the variations of climactic change. Man is of a sudden a session and communion with those forces above and beyond his understanding and control. Our native Indian ancestors were no different in this respect. But unlike others, they found the key to life. The power of perpetual regeneration in the concept of the equality of all things, animate and inanimate, and that interrelation, none dominating, 
non-expendable, deserving of the utmost respect and reverence, in a word, sacred. Harmony and balance of all these, the fecundity of the land and purity of the waters, have life-enhancing power. This, I believe, was the concept of our archaic ancestors who left us mute clues in their men and two stones. Though silent to the ear, they speak to us in other ways. This is exactly what our oral tradition teaches us. Where else did this originate? except with our archaic ancestors right here in New England. Certainly, these were not European concepts. The earlier voyages along this coast all reported contact with a handsome, healthy, happy people. This soon changed with European diseases decimating our coastal tribes. When I was a kid, I used to wonder about Massasoit, and one of the things I wondered was, why would he welcome the English? Why would he be so kind to them? Because everybody said that, you know, he was such a humanitarian that he felt sorry for the pilgrims, so they gave him corn and all this stuff, you know. That's a big, self-serving American myth. It's just justifying their, their, their presence here, legitimizing the taking over of territory by saying the natives welcomed them. The native people that made an alliance with Plymouth Colony, Massasoit's people, Pocanoket of the Wampanoag Nation, they made it basically because why would they want to have two enemies? The Narragansetts, whom they could probably consider to be their biggest threat, or these gnat-like English people that kept coming around the country, but they never seemed to stay before. Now all of a sudden they got a group of them that's building houses that have brought their families, women, first time English women have been in New England, native logic would say, well you don't bring your women where you're going to make war. So let's make peace with these people, use them as allies, they got their strange weapons, and if we make peace with them first before anybody else does, then we'll have them on our side and we won't have to face their guns. To me that's the logic of it. And I can't see that Massasoit or any of the native people in the 17th century would be able to conceive of thousands and thousands of people coming from across the sea to take over territory. It would have not have been in their experience. There would not have been any elders to advise them that this had happened before because it hadn't happened before. They expected people to be normal. And normal to us was entirely different from what normal was to English people. English people were not normal. French people were not normal. Dutch people were not normal. So naturally, Wampanoag, Narragansett, Pequot, Nipmuc, any of these peoples who interacted with each other for centuries that were all interrelated to each other had their own idea of what normal human beings would be like, that they had their own idea of what rational thinking was, and that Europeans were not rational, they were unpredictable, they were dangerous, they were not normal. But you had to somehow come to terms with them because they were there. And it, was, it would be better to make an alliance with them first than to have somebody else do it and use them against you. And also engage in trade and reciprocity with the English as one would normally do with an ally. Intermarry, perhaps. Here, marry my kids. My kids will marry your kids. But the English did not work that way. Let me ask you know? something, though. If the... Wampanoag people had had superior numbers and superior weaponry. Do you think they wouldn't have done the same thing? 
to speculate what Native people would do if they had the numerical numbers. Well, for one thing, Massasoit, when he met the pilgrims in March of 1621, had with him a retinue of 60 armed men. In that colonial village, there was about 50 men, women, and children. The Poconaca contingent outnumbered the whole colony. And if they had allies in other villages, they certainly could have mustered enough strength to wipe out Plymouth if they wanted to. And indeed, they would not have needed to. All they would have had to do was ignore them and just prevent anybody from helping them out, and that would have destroyed them. Colonized, uh, colon colonial attempts had happened before, and they had always failed because they were very ill-prepared. The Plymouth people were just simply lucky. They happened to stumble into the right place at the right time and were able to, and they did, ne did not even orchestrate the scenario. The natives orchestrated the whole thing. It's just that they had no knowledge of European thought process to be able to predict what the Europeans were going to do next. The Pequot War was a preemptive strike on the part of the English to subjugate the Indians by demonstrating that they, the English, were willing, if necessary, to wipe out, that is, to literally extinguish the cultural and physical being of an entire culture, in this case the Pequots, and that is what they sought to do in the Pequot War. The evidence seems to me undeniable at every level that they meant to wipe out at least every man of that tribe. In that 40-year period, as the population of white New Englanders increases, there's more and more land purchasing and land taking from Indians. And a variety of other acts begin to build up pressure on Native people so that in 1675, um, Philip met a comment, and other Indians in New England believe that if they do not make war upon a white New Englanders, that they will be, in a very short period of time, deprived of all of the remaining land, and indeed, culturally, if not physically, wiped out. So that the, the, the war of 1675-76 is understood at the time, I think, both by uh, Native Americans in the region and by white New Englanders as a struggle for ultimate power over the destiny of this landscape. Now, as a historian, I would say that uh, the notion that Native people are disappearing or doomed to disappear is embedded in all of the writing of 17th century English immigrants. And given that the model for writing history of the United States comes from the Massachusetts writers of the 1620s and 1630s, then I think we really have to accept, or at least consider the possibility, that there is a discourse of disappearing Indians which is foundational to the story of the United States. That's something that Anna Pashman and I talked about quite often, that none of this is in the past. Now, when the land claims uh, uh, started here in the Northeast, uh, again, that same basic argument, you know, this was all in the past, and, and uh, the most favorite argument that we heard from the opposition to any of our land claims was, uh, well, uh, sure, there might have been a lot of things that were done wrong to Indian people, but I didn't do it, and I wasn't here, and my ancestors weren't here. Why should I have to suffer the consequences? Well, my answer is always the same. <laughs> you know, the people who protest so violently against accepting any of the uh, responsibility for the injustice, those very same individuals make no protest whatsoever to accepting all the benefits of that injustice. But we still suffer from the results of that injustice. 
So who then is supposed to accept the responsibility? After the conflagration of King Philip's War, it was hardly a popular thing to be a native in this region. There was a great feeling against these people, even the Christian converts in their Christian communities. Except for the period of colonial whaling and that which reached further into the 1800s and the offshore shipping uh, other than local drift whaling took them further offshore. They were great seamen, much sought after as boat steerers. The boat steerer was the harpooner. And many of the crews, even though they had a white captain, had an Indian crew, and if not an entire Indian crew, a sizable amount of them were native people. There were even some of the captains of native descent who were quite well known, and they certainly made that their, their shining example of their ability, but not every community in the area was a whaling community. So those more inland, those that were uh, surrounded by uh, then growing towns and cities, were very much a forgotten people. In, in my own thinking about it and after sort of looking at it and hearing the stories from from grandparents and hearing the story from uh, luckily I was still alive when, and old enough when great grandparents were around who still sort of lived real close to that I have a great grandmother who lived in a stone longhouse in a place called Union Village which is part of North Smithfield at this point in time and the house is no longer there but the way that she grew up and knowing the things about the herbs and knowing the things about gathering and knowing the times of years of year that you did various uh, things um, and trying to have that shared and, and knowing the stories of, of some of that it made you realize that part of who we are today is based on them taking it underground as our survival tool and taking our traditions and turning them into values. And what we've been able to, to accomplish is, is that, in fact, we were a core of people that moved out from that. And, and it's, the federal government doesn't like hearing the homelands model, but it's like our homelands are where, for the most part, we stayed. We just moved into different parts of it and moved in where the industry and the work basically was. But we settled as clusters. There are a lot of clusters of families that settled in the same place. I, I look back at some of those old photographs because I have a collection of those old photographs of the 1920s with my, some of my family members dressed out in Western regalia. There was a large popularity with the reservation Indians, the taming of the wild Indians that sort of you know took 40 years to quiet down from the late 1800s. Uh, 1880s to say okay all the Indian wars are over we've got them settled down um, look at you know let's let's look at them as sort of we're moving them from being these sort of sideshow freaks to these you know beautiful people that are different uniquely different and Eastern people are saying well our survival has been different but we're still native as well so this sort of shifted and, and these people are now saying well our dynamics we're comfortable with our dynamics we can now say this is who we are and those groups in a lot of ways always were connected it was just the issue of bringing them out saying let's have a public celebration now that sort of the ramifications of who we are are starting to to quiet down they're, they're dimming down and saying we compete we're now some of them we're, we're business people some of them own their own businesses. Some of them were in a, in a good position to be able to say, let's take the chance. We, we don't see anything negative happening to us for stepping out at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So they started to do that. I mean, for the longest time, the three major celebrations were the Mashpee Wampanoag Powwow, the Narragansett's Annual Meeting, and the Nipmuc Fair. Those three communities sort of have existed for time immemorial in New England 
or in Massachusetts specifically, as having annual events that people from all other parts of New England would come to. And it was to celebrate that, even though their look had changed and they sort of had taken on this Western approach, which was marketable. That's what people were expecting to see. So that's what they did. The first big uh, powwow, for example, in northwestern Connecticut, the Statico, mm -hmm. was in the early 1930s. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember being there, but all I saw were legs. <laughs> <laughs> Something about your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> saw a lot of legs. But that, and, and, and what I mean by that need for identity was not amongst ourselves, but for the outside world. Mm -hmm. And so that identity fed into what the stereotypical image mm -hmm. of Native people mm -hmm. was. So uh, at Scatacote Powell, there were a lot of teepees, there were oh, a lot of yes. headdresses, mm -hmm. you know, that was certainly not in indigenous to the area, but it was saying, we are Indians, mm -hmm. um, recognize us as such. There was this tremendous need. Mm -hmm. um, what I saw is that reemergence, that uh, that restrengthening of native commun uh, community and identity, of not only saying who we are mm -hmm. amongst ourselves, but saying to the S of the outside world uh, who we are. That was very important, and that was what Nana Passionate was born into. Mm -hmm. It was all that foundation was already set that 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 period. Even that little bit that we have, you know, everybody wants that too. Everybody, you know, we got a little bit of our spirituality in that, and everybody's trying to pick that apart. You know, the Maybe age because they, they desperately would like to to achieve it, and they're so far away. Yeah, they're jealous they of that too. They see wonderful, but yeah. They want everything that we have, including our very souls, and we're not going to give that up very easily, you know, because that's it. That's all we got. And, you know, it's not that we're being unfriendly or anything else like that. I mean, doggone, we've been the friendliest people in the history of this country. You know, but enough is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, we have always been on the defensive. But you, you know, maybe there's a shift. Um, I, mean, I went to a Lawrence bookstore, and I, there was a, there's this explosion of books on Yeah, people. it's more of that exploitation. That's yeah. exploitation. Books, you know. It is and it is. It is. People are making money off of this stuff. We're getting nothing out of it. We're getting nothing out of it but a bunch of curious people who think we got more to give. They think we got more. And there's certain things that we can give. But you're, you're, you've been elevated to uh, the... Uh, An inhuman status. <clears throat> I'm, I'm it's but people want to know about it before. They just, they, they they just exploit you and step on you. They're still exploiting and, us. And, and didn't give a damn about you. That, you know, it's dumb, right? It's not so much that they understand these things at all, it's because they have a need, they have a lack of it in their society, or a perceived lack, because they do have it. They just don't want to deal with it because our seems more cool for some more reason real. or other. More real. It's not more real. Well, it isn't. So. It isn't. Well, it's just, it's just, it's just that people seem to have gotten bored with them. their own toys and now they want ours. Mm -hmm. And they've always been toys. And it, it, they dabble with it and then they become an instant expert. They go around writing books or go attending you know, all these workshops and, and, and all of a sudden they're more expert in our culture than we are. And it's, it's taking our very identity away from us. It's taking things, the most sacred things that we have away from us, away from our control, because they say, you know, they start spotting off things like freedom of religion. And that's not our invention. We believe in our things, and we believe in, in your things, but we don't have to know your things. Your things are just as important as ours, but yours are yours.
was how to negotiate this extraordinarily precarious boundary space, which is psychological and historical and cultural, in such a way that on one hand, he was never catering to white people, but he was also never catering to a kind of false and easy antagonistic stance to them. Uh, he was walking a line in which he would insist that there was nothing easy to be had in understanding Native New England cultures. You had to work and study just as you would for any culture. The things that, you know, you, you were in, in class and wondered, well, why do I have to know this? And they say, because you might use it in your future life. And I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting in my job to use algebra. They made me learn it. They gave me two years of it, and I haven't used it since I got out of the algebra class. They made me learn so many different things. And the things I wanted to know, I was not able to learn. And finally, you know, I just made a decision in college that I'm, I'm through with all this interdisciplinary stuff. I'm going to learn something that I want to know, and I quit college just because I wanted to get an education. And they weren't providing me one. They were making me take courses in order to get a cumulative average. I didn't want a cumulative average. I wanted to learn something. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, anyone who knows him knows he wasn't just sort of a smooth diplomat. He was always very direct. He was always very upfront with his opinions. He had no patience uh, for those who were going to kind of uh, uh, hold back and, and uh, try to apologize for uh, things in the past that, uh, that uh, could not be, should not be apologized for. So I don't want to suggest that at all. But I think that he was uh, a very powerful influence on, even on the conventional scholarship that's being done in this period, and that's something that really needs to be emphasized. And this is from a person who didn't have a BA uh, degree because he didn't see the point of getting one, uh, and then talking about his influence on people who are have advanced graduate degrees. And, and another thing, I mean, think about this, you know, they talk about native people and scholars. You ever hear that? Listen for it. It's like Indians and settlers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Native people and scholars. What's a scholar? Native people can't become scholars. You're either a native or you're a scholar. That's saying natives are ignorant and scholars are trained. Think about that. But growing up, you know, in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s, I mean, th this stuff was even laid on the native people who knew they were native within the school structure of Indians were savages, they were no good, they were lazy, um, they were alcoholics, which was part of their uh, coping mechanism. And in the school system that I went to, it was, you know, oh, you got a bad mix of, of, of native today because you sort of went nuts on somebody when you got into a fight out in the playground where it had absolutely nothing to do with who we were a race. It was, you know, the stupid little kid's fight. But, you know, you use that, in some cases, you use the, the, the racism and the stereotype to sort of insulate yourself and protect yourself from saying, yeah, I was a little crazy, and yeah, I am Indian, so if you want to come up against me again, you use it to your advantage. But as you get older and you progress throughout your life, you see, uh, this is really the oppression that you either change as an adult or you carry forward, and then you actually end up fitting into those categories that they place you into. But he came with a with a real hunger to learn um, some of the things that we were doing around here. That was a real cultural move going on at the time. We were doing the museum, um, doing activities, you know, dancing and singing. Um, building a village and those type of things, a traditional village. And, and Nani came around. Um, he was different than the rest of us. I, well, when people came to Maspie, it was, it was uh, they had to go through sort of like an initiation process. Um, we, um, if you were different, you were treated different, and you had to earn the respect of the people here. And um, so he got a lot of... Um, 
harassment, a lot of uh, teasing and those type of things. And if he wanted to stay here, he had to go through it, and, and he did. Something happened as a young man. And one of the things that I was present at was when um, he received his name. There was a rebirthing, a reemergence in terms of identity. And, and Anthony Pollard, along with Skip Black, became, uh, had, a, had their new identity. And that identity began with their names of Peace Autonomy and then a passion. And from that point on, that's the way they were known. And as I look back, he certainly followed that path. And that path began with his uh, involvement with talking to Native elders and, and talking and gathering information within the, the Native communities. And I think that spoke to a lot of he was beginning to be and who he became. Well, when he first came in, he was an interpreter, which, you know, was one of the, that's the, like, entry-level position into the organization, and, um, or at least in terms of, you know, presenting to the public, I guess. Um, And I guess it was a couple of years, it was probably about 1977 or something like that, I I'm, can't quite remember, but uh, that he became the research associate. And he just like read and read and read and read. He was at, uh, well then, Southeastern Mass you know, University, um, did not finish over there and just read and read and read, I mean, I used to watch him read, and it almost seems like, you know, he wasn't reading, but he was just like, mm, you know, just kind of beaming up the information or something, you know. Uh, the, the whole idea about Plymouth Plantation is, a, is a, actually a living museum where we walk back into time, you know, so that um, so that the kinds of uh, artifacts and the tools and the um, material um, uh, representatives of our culture in the 17th century had to be uh, duplicated, re redone. Um, and he was uh, principally responsible for doing the research, and, and we, we were learning, relearning how to do these ancient technologies. You know, so it was a real experience for, for a lot of us. So, but it was his attention, um, his scholarly approach um, to um, his research and the meticulous attention to detail that, um, that really made um, the Wampanoag program a significant and a significant contribution to the overall program of Plymouth Plantation. Yeah, he and he was just always he always held that title as the researcher for the program. Um, well, he was also interpreter, you know, an interpreter, but his main function was as the researcher, and and that really, you know, held in place right up until he became director, which was what 1989. I think, um, and I think the reason that he was given the directorship at that time was because of his just years and years, what was it, 15 years or something at that time of uh, work that he had done and the knowledge that he had acquired. But Nani had a real talent for, you know, taking all of it, you know, gleaning all of the information on the Wampanoag or the other tribes in, that were involved or that were in the area, um, gleaning all of that information and, you know, and then like a jigsaw puzzle, just putting it all back together until he got a complete picture of what life was like for the native people of southern New England. You know, that, that was his gift. You know, that was his talent. Um, a woman I spoke with down in Connecticut, whose name just quickly escapes me, said that he was his work. <laughs> he walked around as his work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> kind of interesting.
had long been an accepted fact that uh, Squanto taught the pilgrims how to fertilize corn with fish. And uh, it was kind of like an American myth. And, and accepted as fact until, even though nobody had found any evidence to support it archaeologically. Um, in 1975, a woman named Lynn Chechi published a short article in Science that uh, presented some ethno-historic information that seemed to disprove that hypothesis. And uh, the article was never really challenged. and basically became accepted by the academic community. The, um, the first real serious challenge to that article was uh, Nani's, Nani's uh, paper at the Dublin seminar. I think that it, uh, it was upsetting to have yet another thing sort of degrade the uh, historical importance of native contributions to American history, especially such a significant one that was, that actually people had said played a central role in the survival of Plymouth Colony. And here's just another, another example of native people getting uh, disenfranchised from any sort of like uh, central role in history, in American history. Uh, especially dealing with Nana Pashman, who I really appreciated and I really respected as a scholar. You know, many archaeologists today, if you talk about Native American scholars, quite frankly, they're very dubious about that. I never was. I mean, why not? He put as much effort into what he did as I did. Could we answer what had become a controversial question? Did Native Americans develop the ability to fertilize their own fields themselves? Squanto had taught the English this method, but anthropologists in the 70s had questioned this. They had suggested that, in fact, Squanto had learned this while he spent time in England and brought it back to them. What we had for the first time was an actual archaeological site that was a field that we could date to the historic period, and it contained fish vertebrae. But, uh, it clearly is in the hill, not in the uh, deposits below the hill, so I, I, I think if, if we're talking about the use of fish for fertilizer, this might be a, a, a you know, excellent piece of evidence to support that idea. Yeah. And uh, it really uh, corroborated Nani's argument that uh, Native people did in fact do this before uh, Europeans came, and it, and it was a, an important discovery for New England archaeology. Now one, we have to add this, Jack, and that is, is that one of the reasons why that's such a big issue is, is that when the English requested from the king a charter that would allow them to take Native American land without any compensation in the 1620s, their reasons for it were set, was that they were a nomadic people that had no attachment to the land. So it was politically important for them to argue that they showed no interest in working the land, in investing in the land. And that's why it's a politically important issue. It was then, and it still is now. Any other questions?
Brother Solomon? Man? What have you got now? What? An intertribal, he says. Okay. Is this one with vocables or does it have words? His funeral, which I think, uh, which I know uh, was thought about very carefully by his friends and family and done in a way that they knew would be acceptable and pleasing to him. To me, it was a very, it was a, a real feeling of returning to the earth, someone who had understood the earth and understood life. And uh, the, the feelings that it left us all with was, they, they were so positive. He was uh, wonderful to watch when he was dancing, head upright and chest out. I was fortunate enough to watch him in his very last dance, which was at the uh, Skimitzen, and uh, saw him come in and took his photograph and got a big smile from him at that time. And, uh, uh, then was, of course, so shocked to hear that that had been his last dance and his last conscious uh, moment. The last time, as I said, that I saw Nana Pashman, he was dancing in a circle. And the last time that I saw Nana Pashman's son, at the time I didn't realize it was him. And I was watching all these young boys dancing, but there was one particular who caught my eye in the way that he was dancing because with his youth, and yet I thought to myself, that kid's got it. He really has it. Look, what's, look at the way he's, he's dancing. Look at the way, what he's conveying there. And then, and it was at Pawas this last um, April. And then all of a sudden, when his name was called out, I thought, oh my God, of course. That's an added passion of son. I just wanted to conclude with that because it's not an ending, it's a continuance. Something like this, so you don't understand, but I am my father, and my father's father, and my father's father, to the beginning of time. And I am my son, and my son's son, and my son's son, to the end of time. I can remember after New Year's celebration a few years ago, uh, a lady had been invited uh, to come and take part with all of us. And um, she had something to say about this area, which uh, I remember. 
which was really quite nice. Uh, she had been world travel, and um, she had been to all the great cathedrals of Europe and around the world, all the great holy places. And uh, after taking part in the New Year's here, she came up to us and said, you know, I've been to all these great places around the world, but she said, I've never gotten the inspiration and peace that I've gotten here. And I know when I heard that, it was kind of a nice compliment for what we stand for as a people, whether we're Wampanoag or whether we're from some other native nation. What he'd want is people to recognize that there are a lot of other people, a lot of other people that hold pieces of the pie. And to do what he did, go and find it, gather it, use what's usable and get rid of what's not usable to you. That's filtering, that's learning, that's, that's what moves you from being um, sort of a philosopher to a scholar is that you use everything available to you to create your learning. And your learning doesn't just stop with your learning, it turns around into your teaching. If we are going to embark on a, a viable, healthy future, it has to be something that both indigenous and immigrant build together. It's based on honesty, it's based on, on moral conscience and convictions, and it's based on our relationship, a healthy spiritual relationship to the land. You know? And that we welcome all, all people to work towards that, that visioning that we're going to be a healthy human species. And if we're going to be living here on Turtle Island, if there's only one way to live here on Turtle Island, and it has nothing to do with our experience and as a manipulative uh, power broker, mil military kind of personality, that it has to be in nurturing life, respecting the, the, the continuity of life, uh, looking upon each other as relatives, working together in, in the elaboration of the spirituality of the land.